Hi, and welcome to another edition of Easy Theory. So today we have talked about several variants of Turing machines, and we want to answer the question, are they actually the right model for computers? Because any type of variant that you pretty much can ever come up with, are, you can show is equivalent to the standard model in one way or another. You can never find something that's more powerful than the Turing machine, or at least we're not smart enough to be able to find such a thing. So what we want to answer is, uh, are they actually the right model for computers? Uh, and what I'm going to give you a convincing argument is that the answer is yes. Um, in some sense, they, they really are the right model. So the real question that we really want to answer is, what do computers actually do? So what do computers, quote unquote, actually do? And it's kind of an interesting question because it really depends on what the computer actually is, but I'm generally talking about what the modern uh, day computers actually do. So generally what modern computers do is they use algorithms of some kind to solve problems, right? And the thing with algorithms is that they have a bunch of math uh, operations of some kind. So like multiplying things or adding one for a program counter or uh, storing things somewhere in some memory. So it's some kind of math operation happening all over the place. So the question about whether the right model is, uh, can Turing machines actually do math stuff? And the answer is actually yes. So what I want to convince you is that we can do uh, all of these operations pretty easily. So can a Turing machine uh, take an input number, can't spell number, that's troubling, uh, x and uh, write uh, x plus 1 on the tape? So like the simplest possible operation is adding one to the to a number. And let's just look at this as an example. So let's say we have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is just some, some number. Then the uh, normal way we add one to this is we, uh, we want to add one. So we look at this right here, we see two ones. So we're going to, we're going to write down a zero for the result and then carry a one over to the next column. And then, so that we have a one with the carry up here with a one right here in the number. So we're again gonna get a zero and carry a one over to here. So we have a one in the carry and the zero, uh, which is in the number. So we'll have a one downstairs because that's what zero plus one is. And there is no carry as a result. So uh, because there's no carry, we're going to have the rest of the number just copied and pasted. So the real way of doing this is to, uh, while uh, there is a 1 at the end, uh, although actually that's not the right phrasing of this. So what we should actually do is start from the end, at going to the front, so from the end of the, the, the right side of the number to the, to the left, uh, going to the, not from, front. And while we see a 1, change to a 0. And then at the end, we write a 1 at, once, we're, once we're done with that. So when we're done seeing 1s uh, and changing them to a 0 in the result, we're going to, at the very end, change it. Uh, either if it's a zero, we're going to change it to a one. But if the entire number was all ones, then by adding one, we're going to make the number slightly larger by one digit long, one bit longer. So we're going to put a one on the front of it, and that's pretty easy to do. Okay, so then in that case, it would be one with a bunch of zeros after it, which is exactly what we would expect anyway. Okay, so we can actually have a Turing machine take an input number and increment it, add one to it. 
And so we can handle all of the um, program counter stuff uh, in the usual way when it's moving one instruction at a time. Okay, uh, what about if I want to do x plus y, where uh, x and y are two numbers? And uh, what I'm going to do on the tape is I'm going to actually give you the number x with a delimiter between them so that I know when one number starts and the other one begins, so it's there's no confusion here. And uh, how would we actually write, let's say, uh, I want at the very end there to be x plus y over here. So uh, I don't care what's in these two parts right here. I care just to have x plus y written somewhere. So how do we actually handle this? Well, the trick is to initially start this with 0 right here, So because we haven't done anything. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, subtract 1 from x, and subtraction works very, very analogously to adding by 1. And we're going to, at the same time, at the same time, we're going to add 1 to y. So x plus y is the same thing as taking 1 away from x and, taking one, and adding 1 to y, and then adding those two together, because the minus 1 and the plus 1 cancel. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue this process, uh, subtracting 1 from x and adding 1 to y, not touching that third one yet, um, until uh, x is equal to 0. And so at the end of the day, what happens is that we're going to have 0 over here, which, because we're going to continue until we get there. Then we're going to have, equivalently, x plus y here, and then a 0. And then all that I need to do, which is really easy, is just to copy and paste this over to here. So copy plus paste. And in fact, if we didn't care where the x plus y was on the tape, then we're already done because it's right here. So, uh, but if we did want it here, we would have to copy and paste and that's easy to do. Um, and I invite you to actually think about how we do that, but it's pretty easy to do. Okay, so we can add two numbers pretty easily because all we need to do is to subtract one from one and add one to the other one in tandem with each other until one of them becomes zero. Uh, what if we wanted to do x times y? Then what we would need to do is uh, the exact same idea but with repeated addition. So here, what you would do, and I invite you to actually think about how this works, is instead of subtracting 1 from x and adding 1 to y, what you should do is subtract 1 from x and add the original x in whole to y. In whole to y. So it's not just 1 and 1 here, it's 1 and a whole x right here. This number's changing, but the thing we add to y is always going to be exactly the same. Okay, so uh, that will allow us to do repeated addition and get x times y in almost identically the same way. What about x to the power y? Then that is just repeated multiplication. It, almost identically, and I want you to think about how you do that too, but it's almost the same idea. Uh, what if we wanted to do uh, any math operation? done on a computer, then what you can notice is that it's just going to be some finite combination of multiplies, um, uh, additions, subtractions, even divisions, and I invite you to think about how the division works here, but it's just going to be a finite number of these operations. So I'm not going to worry about something like uh, say cosine of x, because in in, those, in that case it could be uh, an irrational output, and it's impossible to write a finite length representation of that. I'm worried about what an actual computer does, and an actual computer doesn't work with a doesn't write down an irrational number. It may work with it in some different kind of representation, but it's still working with binary numbers here, which involve addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division, and uh, powers. So in fact, 
If it's just a finite number of these, then we can write an algorithm in the Turing machine could uh, effectively do it, as long as it's a finite number. And it, it always is because we don't do an infinite amount of work in a finite amount of time. Okay, so what was noticed is that uh, these two mathematicians, Church and Turing, um, I'm not sure if they did it together, but this is attributed to them. And in fact, uh, there's a third mathematician I don't remember who's taken off this list for some reason. Um, but the, the, it's not just these two, but this is what is proposed, um, something called a Church-Turing thesis. So it's not something that you can prove, but it's just something that is true anyway, but is, is just not provable. So what they effectively said is that um, any, uh, actually I should say it this way, uh, the notion of an algorithm is equivalent to a Turing machine. Okay, um, and this is actually pretty profound. We, we actually kind of did half of it already, which is that uh, if we have any algorithm, um, then I can make, uh, and um, by algorithm, I mean an intuitive uh, algorithm. So this is an important word here. So intuitive. In any kind of intuition about like what an algorithm is, what you believe an algorithm to be, uh, that's effectively what a Turing machine is. Or we can convert it into a Turing machine. And... Uh, here we have shown that if you have the modern notion of what an algorithm is, then you can convert it to a Turing machine. And, con and conversely, if we can actually build a Turing machine simulator, and many people have done so, and I invite you to actually write a Turing machine simulator on your uh, computer. So take a Turing machine as input and simulate it. So... Because we can convert an algorithm into a Turing machine and a Turing machine into an algorithm uh, because we can just simulate the Turing machine, uh, therefore we can actually say that Turing machines are equivalent. So it is true, but the only issue with this and being able to actually write this as like a theorem or something is that I need then to define for you what intuitive actually means. So does intuitive... Um, intuitive. Does that mean we only work with, say, the x86 instruction set? Is Does that mean we work with all possible instructions? Because then there could be some weird instruction that we have no idea how to do, but it's still an instruction. Uh, do we do... Um, uh, all instructions uh, except, uh, not except, all instructions um, done in a finite uh, number of steps. Um, because, so this kind of fixes this thing because maybe there's an instruction that's just impossible to do in a finite amount of time, but it would be included in this list. So maybe we only focus on the ones that only take a finite amount of time. And so it just really depends on what intuitive means. And if I define for you what intuitive means, then we could effectively prove this. But there's no uh, outset to what intuitive actually means. But that's what they proposed is that even though that this statement is true for modern computers, we can't actually prove this. So the logical consequence of this, because it's true, is if an, uh, not an, if a problem is possible with a Turing machine, then we can solve it. with computers, right? Because they're equivalent. If I can do it with the Turing machine, then I can just do a conversion and make, uh, and I have an algorithm that I can run on, a, on an actual computer. But here's the important consequence. So if a problem can't be done on a Turing machine, 
then uh, no computer can solve it. I'm not saying that the Turing machine, the computer has to be really, really fast and the Turing machine is slow. In fact, the Turing machine is almost always going to be super slow. But I'm, ask, I'm saying, can it be done at all? And if it can't be done at all on a Turing machine, then no computer in any amount of time can solve it because they're equivalent to each other. So we're going to be using these facts constantly to answer questions about Turing machines, about whether they can actually solve problems that we care about. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave your thoughts about the Church Turing thesis or anything related to it in the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. I'm currently doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions, so if you want to contact me, my email is in the video description below. And as always, I'll see you next time.